thing. And uh, let's go for our next talk. Uh, born in 1978, Tehran, Mohammad Nami is an Iranian medical doctor and neuroscientist. He gained his medical specialty uh, in neuroscience and his uh, fellowship in sleep disorders. And not only is he among the university's top-ranked scholars due to his uh, numerous scientific arc arc articles and speech uh, presented in international congresses, but also he has been recognized as a top contributor to numerous international neuroscience events. Uh, during the past several years, he has led uh, several brain awareness and autism works, uh, conducted workshops on sleep medicine slash sleep neuroscience across the country. And he's uh, currently the head of the Department of Neuroscience at Shiraz University of Medical Science, uh, the chief editor of two international journals and the president of the Iranian Neuroscience Society Fars chapter. Uh, he has been a Dale Carnegie's alumnus since 2014 and yearns to gain further, further expertise in the field of orga organizational and leadership training. Uh, sorry, he is also passionate about the concept of neural leadership and how human brain potentials drive uh, his behavior as a leader to inspire others. In addition, he is an uh, avid artist interested in traditional Iranian country music, especially singing. We can give it a try. So, uh, Brian, you please join me to welcome Dr. Nami. Sir, I just turned your microphone on. Do you have my voice now? Yeah, we have. Perfect. Thank you so much indeed. Um, and I really appreciate your kind intro. And I'm very pleased to have the opportunity, immensely pleased to be part of this communication. And my task today is to share with you some of the insights regarding the interplay between different aspects of uh, uh, cognitive processing, either during or wakefulness and especially upon sleep. For me, sleep has been a mystery since uh, several years back. When I started to think about pursuing sleep science and neurosomnology from the brain perspective as my uh, professional career. And when I started to work and, and study and travel and attend courses and stuff, my colleagues were telling me, well, so why you sleep? Sleep is not that complex because we just, uh, you know, sleep and then we wake up. So there are so many other specialties in medicine and also in neuroscience that so we can go and focus on those specific topics. But for me, uh, it was very tantalizing because uh, when I studied some sort of uh, uh, epileptiform discharges, uh, they turned to be during sleep. And that got me to think that there is a two-way street between epilepsy and sleep. And then when I attended some international courses and saw patients with the wide range of sleep disorders because uh, in brackets you know that we got more than 80 types of different sleep disorders and I and I said yeah it is really important to dig into this and have a vertical view of what really happens in our brain when we're asleep and why some people find it difficult to fall asleep or maintain sleep or they have problem with behavioral aspects of sleep parameters some people have issues with, uh, you know, brain long axis. They have problem with inspiration. So there is a partial blockade of the airway and the oxygen exchange is not literally uh, proper. So they have some desaturation, which is intermittently there. So by intermittent hypoxia, they start to develop some sort of, uh, you know, cognitive predicaments upon wakeful wakefulness. So a friend of mine who was a, a radiology resident and his, ring, his name was Reza. We were talking together like 10, 15 years back. And he frequently started to ask me, would you repeat you? Would you repeat that? Can you say that again? And I was like, uh, yeah, probably this guy does not have the cognitive agility that it should be there. So as a medical expert, I expected Reza to be more vigilant in terms of their working memory or attention or learning and the verbal fluency, but that was not the case. 
So, uh, and he was a little bit overweight. So I asked Reza to come to the lab and start, and we start to investigate his sleep bioparameters by doing the polysomnography or sleep test. And it turns out that he has obstructive sleep apnea. And when we had the EEG or electroencephalography during sleep, uh, we found out that some uh, specific brain oscillations are not appropriately uh, uh, you know, uh, maintained as we expect in, in a specific states or in specific uh, you know, stages of sleep. And then uh, Reza got the treatment and then he became well up and about and by next year he attended the and he was just saying that yeah i'm just living a, a whole new life after this i know that this has been the completely different concept of an efficient sleep since now uh, i know how i can use my brain during the day so there is like an uh, I interface between sleep efficiency and cognitive agility and Reza got the first rank in uh, in her national board examination the, the year uh, after, and still he's talking about his uh, uh, you know uh, nice experience of uh, sleep, efficient sleep since then. And yeah, so uh, like Reza, there are so many other people uh, across the lifespan that he have a wide variety of different sleep predicaments. And uh, when we are focusing on the neurological, cognitive, and behavioral aspects of sleep issues, then we're specifically talking about neurosomnology, which is a, which is a field of practice, which is a field of science that is practiced in uh, some top university, top-notch university, uh, and neuroscience departments across the world. Um, this is something that should be in close connection with cognitive science, and that's why we have been much interested into the concept of cognitive neurosomnology and you know incidentally it is like cns so cns is like either way we have central nervous system which is pretty much important in terms of our cognitive uh, uh you know uh data processing in our brain and also we have the neurosomnology and cognitive neurosomnology which is also an, an, another cns and we found in our uh, number of researchers that I and my colleagues would been doing over the past uh, 10 years, we found that there is a solid relationship between stages of sleep and the structure of sleep with uh, cognitive processing and higher order processing in terms of different domains of a performance during the day. So as per the tests that we are taking from the subjects in our uh, neuroscience laboratory, uh, we have the brain cognition and behavioral setup. So we, we submit the subjects to a wide variety and different range of uh, uh, neurophysiological testing and neuropsychological examinations, also some kind of, you know, behavioral examinations. And, and in some cases, we all, we at the same time, do the sleep test. And putting them together, we're going to cross-correlate the findings from the sleep uh, test with the cognitive findings. So it's been a whole range of uh, you know efforts uh, from different view angles to all different cognitive domains, uh, and uh, uh, we we could uh, present together with other the other experts in Iran and and other countries in this field that yeah there seemed to be a very very reasonable and uh, discernible link between uh, the, the neurodynamics of brain oscillations uh, with uh, sleep efficiency. And something which hampers the sleep efficiency and the sleep bioparameters are not properly there, then the cognition is going to be drastically negatively affected. And uh, yeah, to begin with, uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the concept of the whole concept of sleep for those who are not uh, well familiar with that perhaps. So we know that it is an, it is an important process that uh, is uh, implicated with the processing of memory and other cognitive capacity measures. And uh, the, the memory processing is in part related to the consolidation and reconsolidation of the wide type of uh, memory uh, functions across the brain. And we have several uh, neural transmitter systems that they are being changed upon efficient and inefficient sleep. 
So we know that some types of memory will be consolidating during sleep and they are associated with the specific microstructures or specific signatures in the sleep EEG, which is called, for example, uh, uh, the sleep spindles. And there might be fast sleep spindles when the, uh, the, the frequency is more than 13 hertz or there might be slow sleep spindles when the frequency is less than 13 hertz. And also another aspect of, of, of sleep efficiency and sleep dependent memory processing uh, is, the, is, is the way that the biological rhythm and circadian rhythmicity plays a, a role in it. So we need to study the sleep from the biological standpoint to, found, to find out any uh, discernible links between stage of sleep, specific stages of sleep, and memory functions. And it's all about the frontal part of the brain and the hippocampal structure, which is, which is just uh, deep-seated in the latter part of the brain. So we have the left frontal and hippocamp amygdala hippocampal complex. So the amygdala hippocampal complex and frontal lobe are just reverberating uh, the data. And through this give and take of the data information flow, the information are being consolidated and even reconsolidated during specific stages while we're asleep. While we're asleep. So you know that we we just you know have a very uh, uh, slight transition from wakefulness to uh, non-REM sleep stage one which is a shallow sleep then we have the main stage sleep which is sleep stage two and n2 and then we have the slow wave sleeper n3 and by that we will just you know uh, be transferred to another amazing and contradictory uh, stage of sleep that while our brain is in deep down state it is very very active and it is also hard to waken the patient the subject but the brain is, is is literally very active so the combination of these four stages in one and two and three and and ram are called a sleep cycle the sleep cycle normally takes for like 90 minutes and we we need we got to experience like four or five sleep cycles from the time we we fall down sleep and then we wake up in the morning so uh, it, from the whole perspective slow wave sleep and REM sleep are two specific uh, categories that we experience and, and all different changes which which happens in our brain and our cognitive system are kind of cross correlated with some sort of signatures in the brain oscillations for example we have the slow oscillations spindles and sharp wave ripples and they are generally uh, seen in slow wave sleep n2 and n3 and for the ram we got PGO or pedunculogenic occipital uh, waves and theta oscillations so we have like sawtooth Theta. And these are some kind of hallmarks that when we see them, we label, we stage that specific uh, uh, part of the sleep as a given stage. And we already well know that uh, sleep is divided into non-REM and REM sleep. And for non-REM, we got N1, N2, N3. And some, some kind of the EEG uh, signature and EEG uh, features are spindles and caps that I'm going to touch into that uh, I'm going to touch on it later on and tap into it which is cyclic alternating pattern and uh, the, the whole different kinds of cycling alternating patterns allows us to experience the arousal instability so while we why we have this ups and downs during sleep why we have the transition between the sleep cycles when we have the integrity in sleep cycles all they are all of these phenomena are dependent to the caps or cyclic alternating patterns that I'll dig into that later uh, a while a while later and also we have uh, slow wave sleep in n3 uh, which is predominantly being um, you know filled with uh, slow Delta activity or less than four Hertz or three Hertz oscillations for REM sleep we have phasing and tonic uh, parts or stages of sleep and also we have rapid movements in the eyes and these are quite important to be discussed but maybe for another uh, you know talk we need to tap into more details about the neurobiological and neurochemical interplays between different parts of the neural circuitries and how they are going to work hand in hand to process our brain function and to transit uh, from one part one stage of sleep to another sleep another stage or maintain uh, you know sleep propensity in a specific uh, stage and that that is uh, crucial uh, and 
with regards to memory processing, we know that it is not uh, only about integration and translocation or consolidation, stabilization, and enhancement, but also it is linked with around, uh, like, like erasure or loss of information that we do not need to reconsolidate. And some people who do not uh, have this, uh, uh, you know, distinct brain function to get rid of all those unwanted memories, maybe they experience uh, some, uh, uh, you know, behavioral affective problems like post-traumatic stress disorders. So we, we have this whole machinery of reprocessing and reverberating the data in our brain from the hippocampal and amygdala hippocampal complex to the prefrontal and, and frontal part of the brain and during the sleep, we have this capacity to reorganize all those, uh, you know, information chunks. And in, during wakefulness, we have the uh, uh, specific memory function capacity to recall and to retrieve whatever we want to. And that's uh, in part really connected with the quality and the structure of sleep. So most of us are familiar with uh, different types types of memory, we have declarative and non-declarative memory, we have explicit memory for declarative memory that they are divided into episodic or semantic, and for non-declarative memory or implicit memory, we, we, we do something that we know how to do it, but it's not explicit, like procedural skills like fear conditioning or conditioning in general and priming. And one of the research projects that we have had uh, like seven, seven, eight years back, we were trying to focus on uh, the importance of sleep on motor procedural memory. So uh, we selected motor procedural memory uh, in connection with the sleep function because we already have had some evidence suggesting that there is a, a broad range of perceptual and motor procedural tasks uh, were improved um, in performance after uh, adequate and efficient sleep. And that's that got us to think that probably, yeah, we need to find out the dynamics in the brain oscillation and specific uh, hot spots or cortical hops that they are implicated in that in that reprocessing a uh, function of, of uh, uh, oscillations in the brain. And uh, other, other data also support the fact that we have overnight improvement on a procedural task, which is correlated with slow wave sleep but we didn't exactly know by that time that which parts of the brain are taking the main role in that function. And also, according to literature, we had the, the data that sleep spindles were associated with improvement of motor sequence task. This motor sequence task is, is that you're using your non-dominant hand and you have a keypad. So you would be asked to, to just you know, punch a series of digits in a specific sequence. So uh, the faster you can do that, the better it would, it would be. And first you need to learn. So by time, uh, the, 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 the speed of punching those digits and also the number of errors, either commission or omission errors, are important factors to measure the competence of, of performance in that specific task. So first we ask these objects to do this and we were having uh, some uh, referrals to our lab uh, given the opportunity to have a sleep in uh, or a nap during the day in our laboratory. Uh, so they had the training with the rotation task first and, the, and their task was to click on the mouse when they wanted to just, you know, freeze the, the arrow on the given dot. So when it was when it was spinning at a very fast, fast pace, the subject's task was to put uh, the mouse click when he wanted to fixate this arrow on, this, on the given uh, dot. So it turns out that people, uh, subjects who had the chance of diurnal nap had the better performance score in this. And then uh, we, we had some sort of a positive correlation between the of uh, the amount and proportion of the slow wave sleep or N3 with the improvement of the task performance. So the more subjects had uh, slow wave sleep, the more they had uh, better performance in that specific motor adaptation task. And this is another uh, task that they went through. So we wanted them to do the sequence motor skill task 
and their task was to use on the left hand to type the sequence of quick uh, but an accurate uh, sets of uh, digits in, uh, in, in, a, in a given sequence. And we were asking them to do the tapping in 30 seconds and he had you know, rest blocks for 30 seconds as well. And he had 12 training trials and they have like, for the retest, they had three trials to be scored for their skill performance. The outcome measures was the number of correct sequences per trial and the accuracy was the number of errors divided by the sequence. So for example, this subject wanted to punch in 41324 and as many times as possible and as accurate as possible, uh, uh, that should have been punched and we could have uh, scored by the number of correct sequence and also the number of errors within a given period of time. So the experimental designer study was that we have given the chance for undergoing a nap during the day for 60 to 90 minutes somewhere between 1.30 to 4 p.m. And they came to the laboratory at 10, 10 a.m. So they got the training and they were staying in the lab. And in the afternoon, some of them were not given the chance to go to the, to the study room and they were just given a book or something to read and to be there. So because we wanted to make sure that they are not taking a nap. And some of them were given the opportunity to experience the diurnal power nap. So by 6 p.m., we were retesting the subjects to make sure that what kind of uh, performance measures were there and we wanted to cross-correlate those performance measures with the sleep uh, bioparameters. So it turns out that those who didn't have any nap, they didn't have any improvement in performance for the motor sequence and the motor skill memory score. So it shows that probably the offline performance is uh, exclusively improved when subjects had the opportunity to experience nap during the day. So why did they in the motor skill memory score uh, after uh, a given opportunity for a diurnal nap. From another perspective, it turns out that the more stage two REM sleep, non-REM sleep subjects were in, the more, uh, the higher uh, motor skill improvement was there. So by a positive correlation and a uh, Pearson index, which indicated uh, a linear correlation between stage two non-REM and motor skill improvement, we found out that sleep two, uh, stage two of sleep and uh, nap would literally improve the motor skill, imp uh, motor skill sequence task. And that's in part, uh, you know, functions between uh, the, the networks that we got in the cerebellum and the frontal part of the brain because we have the cerebellum cerebral pathways as you know and in the frontal part of the brain it's not only the M1 it's not only the primary motor strip we have the premotor and also we have the supplementary motor area not only that we have even the cingulate motor area so it's like a hierarchy of motor processing and all these specific interchange of information with respect to motor competence is in part uh, linked and related to a function of stage two sleep. And we wanted to know that which part of the motor strip is uh, literally, you know, implicated and functioned in, in terms of this uh, learning, learned capacity. So we had the power and we had the motor uh, skill improvement in C3, which is a non-learning hemisphere. And in C4, since the, the subjects were, were doing the task with their left hand, they had the right hemisphere as the learning hemisphere. So for, the, for C4, we were just making the, uh, the correlation. And we, we also have the, had the wavelet analysis for, for the spindle power. And it turns out that uh, those spindle powers, uh, the spindle power and also the, the number in the motor, uh, the, the performance, were slightly positively and negatively correlated in non-learning hemisphere and learning hemisphere. And when we subtracted these two power from each other, from each other, for instance, we, we subtracted the non-learning hemisphere from learning hemisphere, 
and it was something around like 16 hertz and we found out that at the specific uh, frequency band which which is 16 hertz there was a positive strongly positive correlation between the subtractive po subtracted power and the motor skill improvement and uh, that was more of the function of the learning hemisphere and we figured out that C3 has more uh, predominance for uh, the fast asleep spindles in N2. So the higher the power of spindles were in the C3, the better performance were expected from the subjects to do in the motors, motor digit sequence task. Another interesting question to, to tap into was the link between the emotional memory and sleep. And we have a bunch of uh, uh, you know, literature supporting the link between REM sleep and uh, the emotional <clears throat> memory processing. But by that time, we didn't have a really clear clue that what could be the exact definition justification of the brain signal transduction in different parts of the cortical hops with emotional memory processing with respect to sleep bioparameters. So like the other study we, we pursued with the with the study design. But before that, we knew that uh, there are some similarities between the function of the emotional processes in the brain and REM sleep. So when we, when we go emotional and we experience something which has got positive or negative emotional load, we know that there are significant amygdala hippocampal uh, complex interaction. We have raised level of acetylcholine and we have limbic theta rhythms. And surprisingly, it turns out that in REM sleep also, we have the same kind of similar, uh, you know, uh, interactions, which is amygdala hippocampal reactivity, and also we have the high level of acetylcholine and limbic theta rhythm. So by this, we have hypothesized that perhaps similar sort of, uh, you know, neurophysiological uh, changes will happen during REM sleep, which sort of justify our uh, emotional memory processing. And we hypothesized that REM sleep would enhance the emotional memory consolidation, and that is in part related to theta activity in the left temporal area. And we tested the hypothesis by running a double-armed parallel study. So we had like 16 subjects that didn't have a chance to go for nap, and we have 15 who had the nap chance. And the nap was for the mean duration of 90 minutes. And we did the polysomnography in our sleep disorders lab and behavioral sleep unit. And uh, in the more uh, uh, early at noontime, subjects were trained and they were given 120 pictures. And 60 of these pictures were emotional, either positive or negatively loaded emotional images. 60 were neutral. And by 5 p.m., after they woke up, from their nap or or they were not given the opportunity to have nap they also had another set of 120 pictures and they were all novel the other set of 120 pictures were divided into 60 emotional and 60 neutral and by late in the evening what we did is that we were retesting the recognition of the inf visual information specifically the, the, the emotionally loaded visual information that they have been exposed to before and after the nap. But in 5.15 p.m., we were, we were like giving, giving them or submitting them like six, 360 pictures. And from this 360 pictures, 120 were old and 160 were new. And from ne the neutrals also, 120 were old and 60 were new. And we're trying to find out that what uh, is the proportion of number of the emotional and neutral images that uh, subjects would, rec would recall uh, in two groups. Were, would it be even possible to distinguish any differences between the, the recognition capacity in two different arms? Those who had REM sleep during their nap, because when we have nap for 90 minutes, we perhaps experience REM sleep. From those uh, 15 uh, subjects like three of them didn't have any any RAM, so we we had the we, we could not do the uh, intention to treat analysis at the end of the experiment. We had to do the per protocol, but three of them even did not have any uh, RAM experience. 
But anyway, majority of cases who had the REM experience were found to have an increased uh, uh, performance in recognition memory. So those who didn't have any ha didn't have any nap in green uh, bars, you can see there were no significant changes. And those who had the chance for uh, uh, for experiencing nap, they had significant improvement in recognition after four hour uh, test. And the four hour test minus 15 minute score, uh, we've, we, we again found out that those who had the nap were, were outperforming the, uh, than those who didn't. And uh, we're kind of curious to find out the relation between this activity and the uh, uh, power spectral analysis of uh, uh, specific parts of the brain, cortical areas like bifrontal areas, and also the uh, the spectral the spectral power band in in the bifrontal areas and emotional memory processing, and we found out that this has been markedly significant for theta rhythm. So when we were talking about something between four to seven seven eight hertz, it was the most uh, implicated, most significant uh, band which which was. Uh, uh, which had something to do with emotional memory processing when subjects were performing properly in emotional memory recognition task, they had more of the bifrontal theta activity in, in that given, those given areas. And also in the left temporal area also, we have the predominance of sawtooth rhythm. And by this, when we're, when we're having the dreaming during RAM, uh, sometimes if we're having a saw, if we see this sawtooth theta oscillation in the left temporal area, perhaps we can say, uh, we can tell but in some levels that subject is experiencing uh, dreams and the content of the dream is emotional. And when we have, and we, in another study, we have the dream content report from the subjects and we cross correlate that with the, with the power of the theta rhythms in left temporal area T3 and it turns out to be positively corrected positively correlated. So the more emotional the dream content was, the more power for the theta oscillation was in the left temporal area. So by this, we could say that sleep can selectively enhance the offline consolidation, both the motor and emotional memory performances. And uh, we came up with the fact that sleep, a slow wave sleep could improve the sleep dependent motor adaptation and also the spindles at 16 hertz were positively linked, correlated with sleep-dependent motor sequence task. And with regards to the me emotional memory enhancement, we found out that REM sleep uh, activity is involved, which is which is involved in the right right dominant prefrontal theta activity, uh, is is linked with the emotional memory performance. So those who had more of the theta activity in the right in the right prefrontal theta. Uh, they had better performance in recognition uh, emotional memory task. And uh, early on, I was, I was touching on something regarding the, uh, the cyclic alternating patterns. And these are some kind of, you know, oscillatory and some kind of periodic changes in the background oscillation. And the more we have this uh, changes, the more sub, the more uh, the easier the subject would find to fall asleep and or to emerge from sleep to wakefulness. So these are normal changes in the brain uh, waves that they are periodically and uh, happening uh, in different uh, you know derivations in the EEG, and they are cyclic. So they are episodic events, and by this we have the capacity of gating the sensory information, and we have the arousal instability. It helps us to save life. It helps us to survive since our ancestors, they had in evolutionary neuroscience that we had, we know that when they have some kind of threats, so they easily woke up, they would easily woke up from sleep. When they have water, when they, when they have sound, when they have uh, a predator attacking them. So they had the capacity in the brain just to wake up. Even in, uh, in, in the human, when we have, sleep disordered breathing that is considered as a threat because the brain is is fully fully aware and conscious that if the brain falls deep down sleep then there is the possibility to die so the brain has this preconditioned learning that 
when we go down to sleep and the oxygen delivery, the exchange of oxygen is, is less and we have dropped up in the oxygen saturation, then there is this arousal signal, this alarming ar arousability in the whole cortical areas, and we have these cap signals that they are being that they are going to flourish. So by by the increased cap density, we have we 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 we, we got to be able to uh, uh, save ourselves from death during sleep if we have obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, but those who do not have that problem, they really got some problem. They really got some, you know, life-threatening conditions. So sometimes in a sleep, they go black and they go like cyanotic, and they have desaturation, critically desaturated uh, oxygen in their blood. So these caps are really important. The question is, are caps that they are normally in N2 sleep, are they linked with our cognitive processing as well? So Cognitive neurosomnology is partly uh, interested in finding out the relations between the microstructures in sleep, EEG, and uh, neurocognitive functions during wakefulness. And the rationale behind that is that if we're able to stimulate or kind of modulate these microstructures in specific areas that we have already found out, then perhaps subjects would be expectedly find it easier to fall down sleep and to stay asleep. Vice versa, if someone has problems with memory consolidation, with learning, with attention, with, with language fluency, with verbal fluency, if we do this particular neuromodulation in, in those given areas of the brain during sleep, perhaps that would be expectedly increased and improve the, the wake performance in that, in that given uh, cognitive domain. And these are all the hypotheses. Some of them are already tested. Some of them are yet to be done. And we have tapped into uh, an interesting question regarding the different phases and patterns of uh, uh, cyclic alternating patterns and its relation with memory performance in, in subject with, with obstructive sleep apnea. So we know that for the cap, we have two phases, A and B. A is when we have a rapid uh, synchronization of the whole brain, uh, you know, spectral power, and B is when the brain is back to the to the background rhythm, and this is, you know, as you see in the top of the page, uh, th this kind of uh, pattern A B A B is is just you know repeatedly uh, happening, and when we have A plus B, then we have a cap cycle. So we, when we have A B, and then just abruptly we have another A B, that would be a, a cap sequence. So these are, uh, these are very important to be well identified and someone needs to have the clinical expertise by time to make sure that these changes are, are considered as NAP events or non-NAP events. So uh, uh, it needs expertise. And when we have this, for example, in this, in this tracing, you will see that we have this abrupt synchronization of the brain oscillation in, across derivations and then we're back to, uh, almost back to the uh, uh, the B phase or the background activity. And as you see here in N2, we know that already, we, we already agreed that in N2 we have spindles and we have K complexes. Here there is an exp spindle and sometimes like here we, we, have K comp uh, we, we have spindles and K complexes. This is a phase A and phase B, another phase A and phase B and phase A. So these are cap sequences at, as, as I pointed out earlier. So these caps are really important to be identified correctly. And we also developed with uh, the help of the experts from the computer engineering uh, lab at Shiraz University, we could develop some kind of you know, uh, uh, machine learning to detect these cap signals uh, during uh, you know, different stages of sleep. And as you see here, it is, it is kind of uh, obvious to delineate the caps A and cap B. So this is cap phase A, first one. The pink, the pink bar is cap A, and the background is cap B. So again, cap A, cap E, and cap A and cap B. And these cap sequences are critically uh, hypothesized to be important in processing of information. So even the sleep, even even the the phase A of the cap is subdivided into three different sections, into three different subclasses. So the A cap, which is the first part of the cap cycle, per se, it's divided to A1, A2, and A3. So the amplitude uh, and, the, and the frequency in A cap 
is the amplitude is high as frequency is low. So that's A1 cap. Then we have A2 cap, which is some sort of intermediate. And when we have A3 cap, this is a kind of transition from the A1 cap signals to B signals or the background signals. And we have shown that for the slow component of the cap signals that we have like 0.25 to 2.5 hertz, uh, we have shown in five cases, and there were more, but I've demonstrated five of them here, that uh, there were the predominance of uh, these specific pattern, uh, patterns of cap phases in bifrontal anterior parts of the, uh, of the brain. So here in the lateral view, you can also see that the prefrontal areas and the frontal polar areas of the, of the brain of five, all five subjects were positively loaded by this uh, slow components of cap signals and when it came to the rapid component which is somewhere between 7 to 15 hertz of cap we've shown that yeah they are uh, uh, well markedly distributed in the bi-parietal or in the bifrontal areas of the brain and also central so central frontal central and central parietal areas of the brain of these five subjects were were positively loaded by the fast components of the cap we also did the Loretta, a low resolution brain electromagnetic tomography you're familiar with perhaps. And we did this to, to source localize the cap slow component. And we found and we found that the and the slow component of, of the cap signals predominantly originate from uh, uh, the, the anterior cingulate cortex and the frontal polar areas. So these two areas, the anterior cingulate area, also posterior cingulate area, and frontopolar regions were dedicated uh, to generation of slow component of cap signals. And for the, for the fast or rapid, for the rapid components, we have found that the posterior parietal areas and also the posterior cingulate area were markedly associated with the, with the focal points that they uh, preliminary generate of the fast component of cap signals. And we have been even more uh, you know, um, specific to find out where could be the possible distribution of, for example, phase A1 of uh, phase A cap. So the A1, A2, B, A2, A, and A3, they were also mapped in different parts of the brain. But generally, we found out that, yeah, the frontal polar areas of the brain and also the, the central, central parietal uh, regions of the cortices were mostly linked with generation of the cap, of even the fast signals of the cap. And we, we had the video you know, I can, I'm not sure I can play that here because that's a PDF, but this is like a real-time display of the moment-by-moment the -moment changes of the spatial distribution and the spectral distribution, also the spectral power distribution of uh, the cap signals, either phase A or phase B. And we were going to answer the question whether the cap signals are correlated with with cognitive functions in our in our uh, samples of uh, obstructive sleep apnea, so we found out that the more cap density they have in the left pre prefrontal area, the less cognitive capacity they have. So cap phase A of the cap was positively correlated with the disturbances in cognitive functions, and that is important because if we improve the distribution of cap during sleep by wearing I don't know by something like uh, you know. Uh, variable jacket uh, gadgets or some kind of do-it-yourself you know uh, uh, technology that nowadays are becoming familiar day after day they might be used during a sleep and they might be helping people specifically those who are at higher risk for cognitive decline for MCI Alzheimer's type dementia uh, yeah if if we kind of intervene there uh, particular brain areas during sleep, perhaps we can be expecting uh, an improved performance even in a specific cognitive domains during their wakefulness. And we also use the uh, uh, the Loretta to source localize again that the more we have the cap rate and the more arousable the brain was at central parietal and mainly bifrontal and specifically right prefrontal area, the less we have the sleep, the, the, the cognitive performance. So uh, cap signals and the sleep efficiency were negatively 
positively correlated. And also CAP signals and cognitive performance upon wakefulness were likewise negatively uh, uh, correlated. And uh, it, it, was, it was found that attention, orientation, memory, and verbal fluency, language, and visual spatial skills in those who had obstructive sleep apnea syndrome were significantly lower than those who were control group. And uh, by this, we could conclude that, yeah, there is a correlation between the, the microstructure of sleep that they are partly, uh, you know, uh, translated to cap signals. Also, we have the spindles and other microstructural uh, domains to be studied. But cap signals were, were found to be uh, implicated in uh, this kind of uh, cognitive impairments and uh, things of that kind. So in terms of the practice, maybe some of us are not well familiar with the concept of sleep science and sleep disorders and sleep medicine. So we have sleep science that's to study and to vertically dig into the dynamics where, whereby our brain processes information upon sleep. It doesn't have anything to do with sleep disorders. Mainly we're doing this with uh, normal subjects, with uh, typically development children, with normal, normally aging people. But also when we have uh, sleep neurology, we're kind of curious to find out what could be some differences in, and also the disruptions in brain oscillations in people, in subjects with schizophrenia, with depression, with anxiety, but the, and the subjects with post-traumatic stress disorder, with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, how negatively their sleep uh, bioparameters are affected and what is the cross-correlation between sleep efficiency and and the sleep dynamics and their cognitive performance during wakefulness. So this is like a translational uh, realm of research and we can do it in animal models. We can do that in a whole range of uh, subjects across lifespan. And we got to know about the, the, the impact of sleep neuroscience finding in sleep neurology and also clinical sleep medicine. And that is sort of a the bench to bed perspective if you like so we can we can team up and we can think about different things putting together all the efficiencies from across across various teams and make new coalitions make new teams and by form uh, strategies we can pursue to answer unanswered questions that we, as we, we move uh, we, we we need to have uh, some sort of infrastructure to study sleep and the sleep-wake disorders. Sleep quality and subjective sleep assessments are part of that. So psychologists are part of our team that they're using questionnaires. We have pen and paper uh, tools to assess the quality of sleep. We have questionnaires for that. Also, we have laboratory tests, some, some subjects, because sleep is a medical uh, issue as well. If we have hypertension or diabetes or, or if we have some sort of bodily pain or we got uh, like problems in breathing, we got thyroid function problem, we have endocrine you know, uh, derangements, these are all going to affect our sleep efficiency. So by that, a, a medical perspective should be also valued here as well. So the laboratory tests should be there. Radiological investigations, if we need, we got to be taking MRI or, or other scans. And we have sleep logs, and we there's like a, a, a table given a patient for a couple of weeks, and they're going to fill in that table. They're going to chart how efficiently they have been going through they have been going through wakes and sleep, and they're going to you know highlight areas or or specific time periods that they had sleep subjectively or they didn't have sleep if they wanted to. Uh, uh, and these are called sleep logs, it's like a diary, and we we have actimetry and. Some kind of you know commercialized devices are are readily available in the market. We can buy, wear them, and they're kind of track our our sleep wake uh, patterns. But we can just expect them as commercial gadgets. So they are by no means medical device. But we have medical devices that you are doing the same thing, and we call them actigraphy or actimetry, and they are sophisticated. Uh, with uh, with a full range of data, we expect to analyze how the subject been going through wake and sleep phases. That's important to to figure out the sleep phase disorders because some people sleep early and they wake up early. Some people sleep late and wake up late. Some people have a totally regular sleep phase pattern. So 
we need to have a clearer view on that. And also we have polysomnography, which is a gold standard of evaluating different range of sleep predicaments. And we have that in our sleep disorders laboratory. Not only polysomnography, we do the neuropolysomnography, that we do the brain imaging without the brain FNIRS or HEG, hemoencephalography, and also we do the whole QEEG brain mapping of the brain while the subjects undergo different stages of sleep. And that's the concept behind neurosomnology because sleep medicine does not, uh, is not really interested in those kind of, you know, peculiar stuffs. They are just interested to find out what the problem is and this is the solution. But for us, apart from that, we are more, uh, also more interested to answer fundamental questions and how the brain works when it's awake and what happens to the brain when we're asleep and in what ways this can this can influence our uh, cognitive health or cognitive fitness or uh, agility so there are full range of different primary sleep disorders as i pointed out earlier they people might have problems and it's prevalent really prevalent people may have problem with uh, with the amount of sleep quality or timing of their sleep yeah, they might have primary insomnias or primary hypersomnias. Some people have sleep attacks, uh, uh, like 5 to 20 percent of the population uh, in different countries, they're suffering from sleep-related disorder, uh, breathing disorders. Uh, we can call them, we can divide them into obstructive sleep, apnea, hypopnea syndrome, or snoring, pathological snoring, or, or they have obstructive hypopnea. And a fraction of people, they have circadian rhythm sleep disorder that I just alluded to a while ago. And uh, we do the, uh, the sleep test, and this is a general snapshot, a very rough view of what happens in the cessation of the airflow during the, the episode that the, when, the, uh, when the subject has a sleep apnea. So when the subject has a sleep apnea, there is like a complete blockade or the total collapse of the airway. So the exchange of the flow would be literally zero and the brain would be craved for the oxygen. And when the, when the oxygen is not there, then the, the cap cycles will be just, you know, skyrocketing and the brain will just arouse and we might be completely become cautious or we just might be confu confusional or become aroused and then back to sleep and this goes and this goes on and on during the during the nighttime uh, you know intermittently some subjects may experience more than like 100 episodes of sleep breathing events in an hour so this is called apnea hypopnea index or ahi any normal individual is allowed to experience like maximum 5 uh, breathing, uh, abnormal breathing episodes in sleep in hour. But AHI less than five is fair and fine, but when AHI is more than fine, then we have the red flag denoting the, the possibility or a clinical you know, discretion towards uh, obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome. And yeah, the treatment is probably, uh, as you're probably aware, is a device which is called continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. Another question is that how the use of the CPAP would decrease the number of caps, cap A1, how this is going to uh, influence the, uh, the form of the oscillations, the structure, macro and micro structure uh, uh, in the brain. And I'm going to wrap up in less than a minute. This is like a circadian sleep disorder which has been shown using the uh, the sleep uh, uh, actigraphy and it shows that uh, the subject has for example this subject sh sh is found to have a regular sleep wake uh, wake pattern some had early uh, sleep hours and early wake ups or some had late uh, or delayed sleep phase disorders these are the actigraphy and sleep log that we're currently using in our sleep lab facility this can be used for the ankle or trunk or wrist, and it can be used for any any subject across the lifespan. And these are the kind of data that we're extracting from wear, wearable actigraph, actigraphy devices, and this is called actigraph. And we and by this we 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 show that in those areas that there are, there are no movements, that where the movements are really minimal, the patient has been asleep. And for those areas that you can see the spikes and the and the yellow light. There are light detectors and there are movement uh, indicators. So th those uh, those uh, parts appear at the time the patient were, was awake. We have different levels of uh, assessing sleep studies 
and we are uh, from the least complex to most complex setups and we do polysomnography in our sleep and hospital based sleep disorders facility also we have home sleep tests and stuff like that so whole range of uh, these uh, uh you know well, sensors are being attached to the patient's body and the scalp and we're checking the electroencephalography, electroechography, the flow and also the chin EMG, the movement of the abdomen and chest muscles. Also we have the probe for the oxygen level, we have probes for the EMG of the, of the limbs and also the body position and we have also the electrocardiography. So 18 different variables are being uh, recorded at the same time we're filming the subject to make sure that any behavioral sleep disorders any behavioral sleep you know phenomenon or symptoms are being detected and we're these are two uh, you know synchronized and when when we when we see something that we're, we, we're cautious uh, and we're suspicious about the the sleep epilepsy or REM behavioral disorder or whatever then we're going to cross check that with the signals in the next monitor yeah and then when it when if it's needed we're prescribing CPAP and then we check the about those sleep parameters again using the CPAP then we're going to uh, follow the patient for the next week for the next three months and every two three months the the subject will come to our facility to get neural and exam neural examination and also cognitive testing we we profile them for cognitive agility and that opens avenues in front of us to find out what we have done for that subject and how differently he's doing now nowadays compared to the time that he has had sleep disorders which is left untreated i hope that this things that i shared with you has opened i hope even even small but new avenues in our in our minds that we're going to join and form teams together and try to answer questions from different different perspectives because no one is perfect i know that and we can do that together. So definitely, uh, I would be very welcoming and open to receive your comments, questions, and or ideas. And we're going to put together the efforts to take this uh, field of research into next level. Thank you so much for your time and for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? So yeah, uh, Miss uh, Hajadi, I'm turning your microphone on. Hello, Ibi. My voice. Your voice is not uh, clear, ma'am. Is it clear now? Yeah, go ahead. Would you uh, speak up a little bit? That'll be better. Okay, I'm trying to be the best. Uh, position. Uh, I have a question about the uh, uh, comorbid uh, disorders of uh, sleep disorder. I understand that uh, sleep has to do with the whole brain and so that uh, many disorders can relate to the uh, uh, sleep disorder actually. But I wanted to know more about the specific uh, comorbid disorders of sleeping uh, disorder. Yeah, thank you. Well, evidence-based data has indicated that the, the risk of cardiovascular disorders and cerebrovascular incidents are tripled in those who have got untreated sleep disorder uh, breathing and uh, those who are suffering from behavioral dis uh, sleep problems like REM behavioral disorders or REM without atonia or sleep talking or sleep walking they have 2.5 times increased risk for degenerative processes, including Alzheimer's disease and uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. So subjects who are uh, experiencing insomnia for a long run, and unfortunately they are taking sleep aid medications, mainly from the benzodiazepine family, they are even Alzheimer's disease. And data have shown that uh, sleep-related problems are positively linked with uh, MI, with CVA stroke, with obesity, with diabetes, with hypertension, and with a, number, with a specific number of cancers, including breast cancer or lung cancer, or prostate cancer. So there is a possible uh, correlation, and there is uh, there's been a well-defined correlation between these, uh, uh, you know, bodily problems with the range of sleep issues. Uh, so we have a question uh, in comments uh, from Ms. Varastagan. Do you want me to turn your microphone on or should I read it? 
Maybe I'm going to read it. Uh, it says it is proposed that gamma and theta oscillations allow for encoding and uh, retrieval of, of episodic memory. So can we use TMS to trigger theta or uh, gamma waves uh, during sleep in order to improve encoding or retrieval of, of episodic memory? Yeah, theoretically, yes. But uh, we have got some practical challenges. So when you are putting the coil of the TMS overhead and the patient is already asleep, uh, the, the use of EMS sig TMS signals may wake the patient up. So we have done this with, with uh, TES or transplanial electrical stimulation. It worked for some subjects. Some of the subjects when it started to have very, you know, minuscule current of the electricity over the cortex, they had this arousability and they woke and they were woken up. So some people, when they have sensory processing disorder, they cannot tolerate any intervention during sleep, but uh, some of them would, would be able to. So uh, theoretically, it is possible, but we need to, you know, dose response to make sure that this not going to disrupt the cycle integrity and also the, uh, the, the, the maintenance of, of sleep cycles. So if it is practically uh, happening, yeah, we can keep on with that research. And ethical issues also are another uh, uh, important point to, to uh, tackle. And that also needs to be investigated well. So they can, do we have uh, time for another question? For two other questions, actually. Do we have time? Uh, let's go for Ms. Musavi. Musavi. Yes, we can. Okay, hello. I want to ask a question about the effects of sounds on a slip. Uh, does binaural bits use for slipping issues? And uh, if it does, uh, how it influences uh, sleeping states? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question to tap into. Thank you for asking. Uh, a binaural acoustic beats or BAB are a kind of intervention which has been uh, slightly uh, effective in helping subjects where, who are suffering from insomnia. And uh, that works like this. You just give like, for example, 18 hertz oscillation as an acoustic sound to the right ear and you have like 15 hertz oscill oscillation being uh, being given and to another ear. So 18 is being uh, 15 is being subtracted from 18. So what the brain pr perceives in the midline that we just came across the idea that uh, the uh, the theta oscillation and also delta activity are very important in the midline in the anterior cingulate part of the brain when we are experiencing N3. So these binaural beats may decrease the latency to N3. And also we have the, the delta power progression. By what time after sleep onset? How long would it take that the subject would experience deep down sleep? This has been shown to be decreased. I mean, the N3 sleep latency has been decreased when the subject has been uh, submitted to uh, BAB. And the BAB should be within the range, And I mean, the, uh, the, the final, uh, uh, and uh, vectors should be within the range of delta and low theta activity. And that works, yeah. You just need to, uh, uh, you know, be more focused on literature research, literature search, and you and, and definitely you come across with a bunch of papers that you're talking about the effect of BAB on sleep efficiency. But it needs to be even more investigated, and there are many more questions yet to be answered in that respect. So we didn't, we did not to foreclose on the so far available data on the efficacy of BAB. Thanks again. Uh, uh, there is another question I think is the last one. Can we go for it? Mr. Ruzbayani. Uh, um, hello, Dr. Nami. Um, good hello. evening. Um, uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Um, my question is, uh, is this uh, for someone who's studying um, motor memory consolidation and uh, during sleep or the general um, motivation of the study is uh, uh, the whole uh, business of uh, memory mo motor learning and motor memory consolidation uh, um, is it necessary 
to look for the trucks and the EG in all of the uh, channels, for example, for a 64 channel EG recording, is it necessary to look for these microstructures in all regions of the brain or just uh, re electrodes and regions regard uh, related to motor um, processes and motor activity? This, this is my first question. And, uh, I also wanted to ask, um, um, what are what do you suggest are these microstructures other than spindles and slow waves as you said to look for when somebody's studying uh, motor consolidation and also how do you uh, do this automated uh, spindle detection or microstructure detection in your lab thank you thank you for for the great questions so uh first uh for the regions of interest that we are more focused in terms of analysis of the signals in QEEG, we don't necessarily have to be focused on all different 64 channels. We do 32 channel uh, recording during sleep, but what we are more focused in that, based on the research question, we definitely generally will refer to as, refer them to as cortical hops. So the frontal part of the brain and also the prefrontal and also the, uh, the, the motor cortex uh, and the parietal areas are are more predominantly involved in uh, in motor processing or pre-processing of motor motor functions. So when we want to answer those questions, we are not going to, for example, be focused on theta uh, area because based on the evidence, this is not the region of interest for motor pre-processing. And when this uh, when we are talking about the the posterior parietal area, that doesn't have anything specifically to do with the motor performance. So Based on the research questions, you're going to choose your uh, regions of interest or cortical hops. And that should be happening with the, through the consultation of the cross-disciplinary uh, panel of experts. So they see the data, they see the, the, the strategy for the research, they discuss over, and they find a way where exactly needs to be vertically studied, number one. Number two is that for the for the microstructure of sleep, we have spindles. And spindle density and spindle power. The density means the spatial distribution and power means the amplitude of the spindle episodes. These are two things needs to be discussed, needs to be well studied. When we have a full range of different questions and we want to cross correlate the answer of those questions with the relation to the, 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 the characteristics of sleep spindles. Also, we have the K complexes. For instance, uh, we have a recent study that is under to be published in the Scandinavian Journal of Sleep Disorders. And it turns out that people with uh, 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 mild cognitive impairment compared to the control group area, I'm sorry, in left frontal and right parietal area. So the K complexes disappear in these subjects. And that's probably uh, helping us to highlight uh, a possible fact that K complexes and distribution of those K complexes could be considered as a uh, neuromarker for the early detection of neurodegenerative changes in the brain when we are focusing more on this uh, sleep-related, uh, you know, uh, parameters. And we can use CAP. We can use uh, CAP signals, and I told you it's a, it's a huge story. You can just uh, Google and go to PubMed and search for the CAP-related studies. They are mainly emerging from the Italian universities, but uh, even in the U.S., some people are more focused on, on CAP research. So just search for Rafael Ferry, F-E-R-R-Y, and other researchers, or Strambi. And these are the research Italian guys that they are doing CAP research and also Terzano. So these are three that I, I could recall now. And CAP are very important in motor processing. Also uh, for spindles are, are very important as we pointed out the correlation between spindle power in F3 and F4 with the left hand motor sequence task learning. Yeah, and uh, I'm not sure about the correlation between K complexes and motor specific motor related learning so I cannot make a hypothesis in that respect but generally that's a very interesting realm of uh, a huge number of questions to tap into and I really appreciate you brought that up um, so I think we're done with the questions thank you very much for the talk 
Uh, I found it uh, helpful. It was helpful for me. Uh, we had a talk from. Uh, I really don't know to what level that was a that was of interest for the audience, but I tried my level best to make it, it simple was, it was to the great. point yeah. and just to make it relevant to the theme of the conference, which was yes, mind uh, and brain. I think, I think most of us found it uh, really helpful because we had a, another talk about from this uh, famous anesthesiologist uh, Emery Brown and. There was That's good. Some... Thank you so much. Yeah, so we're going to close the it. session, and uh, I appreciate your time, and thank you for the kind invitation again. Thanks for accepting the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm sorry, my, 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 my microphone was off. Uh, there is a questionnaire. We attached a questionnaire to get feedback from you about the webinar. And uh, the next talk will be in, uh, in about uh, 45 minutes, about 50 minutes, uh, 8.45 p.m. See you then.